fanfare. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So nice to see the pulpit leaf pews full as usual. Uh, <laughs> you are very welcome here. It is, it is uh, an issue for some folks that we are um, more in the space than usual. And so I just wanted to say something about that fact. There are masks available, I think, at the door. If yeah, uh, they're waving at me, so that's true. If you would rather be masked, go and grab one. Um, if you'd rather not be in this kind of uh, place mess, we could put the sound through into the hall and, uh, and leave the door open so that you can see a little bit. And we, could, uh, we had painting done, so putting the windows up has become a little more difficult, likely. Um, the fans are on, they can go on harder if that helps. Um, but we, yeah, I, I just hope that we can be uh, um, as comfortable as we need to be in the circumstances. Otherwise, it's great to have you here. Uh, Arthur's done the printing and, uh, and you have that in your hands, so don't forget to read. Well, there you are, there's applause for Arthur, and that's good. So I'll be wanting some more. Well, there you are, that's Arthur for you. And a special welcome to our leaders this morning, to Janice and to David. Um, we look forward to your contribution in that way. Um, I better sit at the front. No one ever sits down the front. You could have cardboard pews at the front. <laughs> Welcome, it is good to see you all here today. We're going to light the Christ candle and one person from each of the worshipping <coughs> communities is going to come and light one of the wicks. It's the one that we used at our inauguration service. So there are three wicks in the candle, but we're using it as the Christ candle today. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. So we'll light this candle now. Thank you. I'd rather it called a candle of three wicks than a three wicked candle. <laughs> you don't want a three wicked candle? I don't like wicked candles. No wicked candles. So wicked, three wicked candle. <laughs> Place since time beyond measure. May we be mindful of the calling God places on humanity to care for creation, and may we lead, may we take the lead from the Duringa, Duringa people whose stories are entwined with the stewarding of this place. And our call to worship. Rejoice, folks, Jesus is in our midst. Be glad, friends, Jesus has bread and fish to spare. Sing for joy, people of God. God gathers up the places of our lives that nothing may be lost. 
Our first song is Immortal, Invisible, God, and Only Wise. And we'll stand if we're able. <laughs> Share them 
and us. In Jesus' name. Amen. We have two readings today. The first is from Psalm 83 and the second from John 6. Thank you, Diane. And then Anne from now. silent. Be not quiet, O God, be not still. See how your enemies are astir, how your foes rear their heads. With cunning they conspire against your people. They plot against those you cherish. Come, they say, let us destroy them as a nation, that the name of Israel be remembered no more. With one mind they plot together, they form an alliance against you. The tents of Edom and of the Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hagrite, Hagritites, Gebel, <coughs> Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the people of Tyre. Even Assyria has joined them to lend strength to the, to the descendants of Lot. Do to them as you did to Midian, as you did to Sisera and Jabin at the river of Kishon, who perished at Endor and became like refuse on the ground. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, and all their princes like Zebar and Zanmuna, who said, let us take possession of the pasture lands of God. Make them like tumbleweed, O God, like chaff before the wind. As fire consumes the forest or the flame sets the mountains ablaze, so pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your storm. Cover their faces with shame so that men will, will seek your name, O Lord. May they be ashamed and dismayed. May they perish in disgrace. Let them know that you, whose name is the Lord, that you alone are the most high over all the earth. This is the word of God. The New Testament reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 6. Verses 1 to 15. Feeding the 5,000. <coughs> After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sea. <coughs> Jesus went up to the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy the bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, six months' wages will not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now, there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, 
as when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of five barley loaves, left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that they had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realised that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This is the word of the Lord. And we sing again, sometimes a light surprises the Christian while he sings. I understand this is a bit new to some of you, if not most of you. There's a little, a, a few notes in between each verse. So you can... Not, sorry? Not in this one. No. Oh, well, anticipate <laughs> in one of the songs today. The next one. The next one. <laughs> All right. This one should be named Long Methodist. That's it. Old Methodist. Oh, yeah. The song. words are a bit different there. <laughs> oh, well, let's give it a go. <laughs>
Well, I guess I've got to say that I'm a happy man today because July won the grand final. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was born in Geelong. I, I had lived my first 20 years of my life there, went to school there, and I even trained with Geelong. I didn't get a, I didn't get a game, but I'm happy to say I trained. No, look, it was wonderful. I, I get so excited. Um, <laughs> Now, over the last four months, I've been writing a book, and it's um, it's essentially a book which answers the question as to why I am a Christian, because I'm always asked this question by, my, by mainly my kids' friends um, when they come to my place. There's nothing they enjoy more than than having a theological discussion with me. All of them thinking they're going to trip me up, you know. Um, no, it's fun. Uh, and um, but they were all asking, "Why are you a Christian?" And I've given answers to that all my life, and I've never, I guess, ultimately been satisfied with my answers. Um, I always come away thinking there's a better answer. There is a better answer, and so that's what I've been writing this book. And if any of you are interested, give me your emails and I, I you can get pretty publication copies. <laughs> and I look, I love people criticising my work. I learn from it, so yeah, always feel free to do that with me. I won't get upset. Um, oh, I might actually. Depends <laughs> 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 so on what you say. <laughs> now, one of the things. That I, in fact, I start the whole book by saying, what about God? And, and I look at some of the classical arguments to establish, to, in a sense, to prove that God exists. There are about six or seven classical arguments. Some of them are entirely sort of philosophical in nature. They just work off language itself, like the famous ontological argument. This, this, uh, this argument, I um, it's from the Greek word ontos, which means being. And there's, a, there's, a, there's an arm of philosophy, uh, like ethics, and aesthetics, and so on. There's, a, there's, there's a, an arm of uh, philosophy called ontology, which is the study of being itself. Big questions. Who are we? What are we doing here? What is the nature of this world? That's the sort of stuff of ontology. Well, the ontological argument goes like this. It'll take about 15 seconds. If God is a greater than which can be conceived, think of it, if God is the greatest thing that can ever exist, which is fair enough, that's not controversial, I would say. If God is a greater than what can be conceived, then it is greater for God to exist than not to exist. Therefore, God exists. So it's neat, but it's unsatisfying ultimately. <laughs> because it's, it's a device, you know, it's a clever device. But So a lot of the arguments for, for establishing the existence of God, I really see them as, as sort of ways of, for myself and, and us as a Christian community to establish that there is a type of rational support. There is reason why we believe. I don't like people saying to me, if I say to someone, why do you believe that? If they say to me, oh, I just believe. I, you know, well, that's a terrible answer. <laughs> if someone says to me, if I say to them, why are you a Christian? Oh, I just believe in it. I don't like that. Oh, there's got to be a reason why belief, we believe. And, and that is one of the most interesting things about theology and, for, and philosophy. So, when we go in that search for God, every culture and every person, whether they believe in God or not, whether they've had a background in their families or in their education that has dealt with the nature of God, Everyone has a sort of general perception of what they are sort of expecting. If you, if you ask that question in India, 
what is God, you're going to get an entirely different answer that talks about a multitude of gods, you know. And when Jesus was alive, he lived in an essentially Greek culture. The Romans had captured the Greeks, but the Greeks captured the Romans culturally, really. And if you're a Roman, an upper middle class Roman family, you were educated in Greek. And, and the young people who listened to Jesus, so those who came from educated families, would have read Sophocles and Euripides and all the other Greek tragedies that we read at school. Um, in fact, my wife is studying Euripides at the moment. And, and it's fascinating that you think Jesus heard that when he was a, a young child and so on. So, all of those cultures produce a certain expectations to what we are looking at for when we say, uh, who is God? And we have that same debate today with the New Age movement, particularly, which was, inter which was introduced into Western culture around the beginning of the last century. That was greatly influenced by the Theosophical Society and others that had been into the East and came back with, with exotic ideas about what we could believe and so on. But, so, the debate today and you see the debate in our church, as a matter of fact, you'll find that there are two really sort of broadly different perceptions as to who God is. And this question becomes relevant when we think about this story in John. Now, most of you probably have heard me over the last couple of weeks, I've been moving my way through John. Uh, I love John's Gospel. I am a Johannine person, not a Pauline person. <laughs> and I just love the subtlety of John's work and so forth. And we've seen him go through a whole series of, of conversations, that big conversation with Nicodemus, and then the big conversation he had with the woman from Samaria. Uh, we've seen that, that. You get the big conversations in John, not in the others. They're interested in saying that he did this, he did that, he said this, he said that. John is, is trying to account for Jesus and what Jesus did. And he, he, is, he is aware that explaining who Jesus is is a very difficult thing. And in the mouth of Jesus, you hear Jesus talking to his disciples especially after this incident, the feeding of the 5,000, he, he begins to tell them, you're going to have a hard time explaining what you've seen. And, and at one stage he said, he said to them, they are going to believe you as little as they believe me. <coughs> and it will be because of me that you're going to have a hard time. And I think that's still the way to do it. I think, I think it's hard work. It, it's good work, it, it's very challenging, but it, it is difficult to bridge the gap between what we believe and what are the prevailing ideas outside. And, and for that reason, there are, I think there are so few of us. Why wasn't this place just teeming with people? Because we're dealing with such important stuff about the nature of life itself, the nature of salvation, uh, the nature of who God is and so forth. So, the challenge of this feeding of the 5,000 is made all the worse, if you like, by the incident that happened straight after. Now, this is in the north of Israel, and um, Jesus is moving around the Sea of Galilee, and after the feeding of the 5,000, People were so stirred up by what they saw happen that um, they actually wanted to grab him. It says by force. That means put hands on him and take him into Jerusalem because the Passover was near. Um, I'm sure that that's what they had in mind. They wanted to make him king because Galilee was a place of great ferment. When Jesus was six years of age, 
there was a rebellion in Galilee. Um, a bloke called Judas, not Judas Iscariot, he's known as Judas the Galilean, he refused to pay the tax, the Roman coin, uh, because being a good Jew, it had an image on it. And, it, and it actually it had an image which talked about the deification of Caesar. So a, a, a pious Jew, just to touch that coin, was in a sense blaspheming. And it was a great humiliation that the Jews had to pay their taxes. The Romans were very good at collecting taxes. Um, that's what it, the Romans were interested in, in taxes, corn, oil, that's, that's olive oil, and wine. So it does about deals with life today. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, the, um, Jesus caused real problems in the way he approached the nature of the, uh, of the Jewish religion and his life with, with, with Rome. And of course, eventually they killed him. But when he was six, this guy, Judas the Galilean, uh, he said, I'm not going to pay this tax anymore. I am a Jew. And I am, I am a sincere Jew. And we are told not to handle idolatry, not to have anything to do with it. And he believed that if, if, he, if he sort of took this stand, which was in his mind a righteous stand, that God would help him, that God would come in as God had come in with Gideon and you know there's just a few blokes took on this huge army and defeated them and because they were holy and these men were righteous characters. So Judas the, the Galilean started a rebellion and, and Probably the worst thing that happened was that he overrun, overran the local Roman battalion, about six or seven hundred men, and, uh, and pushed them out. And so people started to flood towards him. God is with you. You've defeated the Romans. And the Romans backed off and waited for about three months. They gathered armies from all around the area. They, they grabbed they gathered troops from Germany, as a matter of fact, who made their way all across to take on this rebellion. And they went through Galilee like mad savages, like the, I guess well, the way the Russians are going through the Ukraine. And they crucified 6,000 people along the roads uh, lead in and out of Galilee. So when Jesus was a boy, he would have seen them, that enormous barbarity. So, what they would, wanted to do with Jesus after they saw the feeding of the 5,000 uh, was politically explosive. It says they wanted to make him king. Imagine, and now the Romans would have heard about this. The Romans had a very fine secret police. They knew everything that was happening, there were informers everywhere, going back to them and saying, guess what he said, you know, and so on. So, uh, so Jesus, um, for political reasons, I guess, said, I'll have nothing to do with this, but also for other reasons, for a sort of a really basic theological reason. And he tries to explain it to them. He just walked away from them, I'll have nothing to do with this. And and the next day they found him. He had gone up to the eastern side where the hills are, the Golan Heights in fact, that's where he went, into that area. And he, um, he was praying, I guess, because from this moment on he changes. He, he, he doesn't do as many miracles. He, uh, he keeps his head down more, no, no big crowds much. And he starts to concentrate on talking to his disciples and telling them, I'm going to be crucified. And they spend their, so their time saying, no, you're not. What do you mean you're going to be crucified? It's ridiculous. You are the Messiah. So that battle goes on. <coughs> and so 
That's by way of introduction. Although, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, I changed my dog. I'll tell you what's happened. I'll be, I'll, I'll, the way I work out, I work on my sermons is I, I, the Sunday before I look up the readings, and in this case I didn't like any of them, so I thought I'm going to stay with John's Gospel. That's what I said I'll do, and I know what the next section is, and I read it on Sunday afternoon or at night time, and that's now in my head, and every day I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking about it, I'm reading stuff, I'm. I'm, I'm maybe even go, going back and checking the language and the syntax, all that sort of stuff, during the course of the week. And by Friday night, my head's a buzz with ideas, and I've more or less got a structure. And I get up about half past five on Sunday mornings, and I put it all together. And this morning, I got up at half past five and said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to preach about any of that. And so I've had to rewrite my whole sermon. <laughs> so, because I was thinking about this, I'm, I'm, I'm going back to what I began by talking about this, this um, search for God and the sort of underlying culture that determines what our expectation of God is. And I would say today there is a sort of there's a struggle within theology generally, and certainly you see it. In the um, in the United Church, um, and and the, it has to do with who we think God is in the nature of God's participation in this world. What we see here is John, as he told us in that uh, first chapter of his, he he uh, he said uh, he said nothing in this world exists that was not made by the Word. And he's talking about Jesus. He said all things were made by him. And then he said this, this character, the Word, came into the world. This is what John, the whole of John's Gospel is about. He came into this world, even though he made this world. He's the actual creator of everything. And he walks into this world and no one recognised him. That's what John said. And he said, then he went to his own people and they, they, they did not respect him. So that is an astonishing situation, you'd have to say, for, for God to be in. And for the Greeks of Jesus' day, that was an impossible concept. It was ridiculous and almost childish and in the end blasphemous. This idea that God would actually reduce himself in such a way as to submit to the limitations of, of this world. This world is mortal, it changes, and it, it has an end and a beginning, presumably. That is, that is not eternal. They are not eternal qualities. So God can have nothing to do with them. The Greeks had their gods, but their gods were sort of half humans. Uh, and they were very close to their gods. And they were sort of mythical characters and so on. But this idea that God would come into the world and actually dabble in the world and put up with the, the constraints and the compromises of this world made no sense. And I think that's true today. A lot of my friends who, who tell me they believe in God, I say, well, describe God. What they describe is a distant sort of character. Like the New Age, my New Age friends talk about they don't use the word God, they use the word cosmos or entity or reason. They say there is a guiding principle that, that looks after the cosmos, as it were. And, I mean, I've got new age, new age friends who said, Dave, the cosmos has, has joined with me. I said, what do you mean? Who's the cosmos? And they think in terms of this distant sort of character uh, that doesn't participate in the world, but stands back from the world, and is in this very broad sense a type of ordering 
principle uh, and a friendly, a most essentially friendly sort of presence. Now, that, that sort of theology is called deism. And uh, it's, it arose in Western culture after the Enlightenment. In the 1700s, when Australia was formed, the prevailing philosophical framework in England was deistic. So, and it's also called the watchmaker theory of God, which means, so God has made the world like a watch, beautiful, elaborate, and self-contained. He's wound it up, and the world is now going, and God steps back and, and takes this sort of avuncular sense of, um, you know, just watches it happen. And in a way, for God to step into the world is a contradiction. If God is stepping in to change the world, change is philosophically, the implication is, something can be better. You don't change perfection. That's a self-contradiction. If you change perfection, it wasn't right before. So this is an argument against miracles, you see. God can't perform miracles, especially ones like this, you know, feeding of the five things. You can't do it because you are disturbing the natural order. And the natural order was made by God, so um, it, you can't change it. it. It must be perfect. Now, that, that is an argument. I don't buy it. But, but, but it, it's a persuasive argument, and it's an argument, if you like, which gets God off the hook a bit. Um, but from my point of view, I take the opposite view. I say Jesus was God, and I say also that he did these things that we read in the scriptures. Now the big one is what happened the next day, or that night, the night of this incident when the disciples got in their boat to row off um, the other side. They rowed out about three miles and Jesus comes walking on the water. That's an extraordinary thing to say. You line up a room full of theologians and say to them, how many of you believe that Jesus actually walked on water? You'd be lucky to get half the people confidently putting their hands up. Oh, no, 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 that's, that, that isn't almost in, in the deist sort of framework. It doesn't make sense. So we have, we have in a, in, in, in a sense to make a decision where we stand on this sort of issue. And the, the story of the feeding of the 5,000 is a significant moment to make that sort of decision. It's a very decisive event. As I said, Jesus changes. From this point on, Jesus is now heading towards the cross. You can feel it. You can feel him change. He becomes tetchy on occasions. He becomes impatient with his disciples. And you hear him often saying, well, how many times do I tell you? How long have you been with me? And you still don't understand who I am. So it's, it, it's a big issue. Uh, but I say that we are talking about real events. Um, that God does participate in this world. Some months ago at Berry, we, we had a minister um, uh, preaching to us. And he played a song by Nick Cave. Uh, I like Nick Cave. I think, I think Nick Cave is a very fine um, artist and big. Now, he is a deist. He believes in God. But this song that, that, that was played to us in church, the opening line of the song is, I do not believe in an interventionist God. Now, how interesting is that? I think that is the way a lot of people who've studied theology do that they actually believe that. So it's a question, it's a good question to ask someone. Uh, do you believe in an interventionist God? You believe 
that God actually came into the world and, and performed these miracles? Do you believe that Jesus actually did rise from the dead in his body? Um, because the dearest God, you see, even that becomes dicey. But the big implication for me is what it does in relation to prayer. One of the main, I, as a pastor, you find yourself in situations often in people's lives when they are either at times of great joy or great sorrow. Um, and as a pastor, you sit with people and what have you got going for you in, in those moments? You've got your personality and your, your, your training as a counsellor, you've got that going for you. The situation is not new, you, you understand that situation. You've also got your friendship with that person and, and other friends, most, in, in times of hard, hard times, most people's friends flee because it's too much of a challenge to them, you know, to confront a friend that's going through a really hard time. But the, the important thing I reckon we've got is prayer. And the number of times you'll find that in the end, when you say to someone, would you like me to pray? People who've never prayed in their life will say yes. Now why are we praying? What is the point in praying to a non-interventionist God? It's not going to do anything. You know, and the sad thing is, I mean, we can't, I don't want to say to the person, look, um, I'm very happy to pray with you, but you must understand, I don't think God's going to step into the world and, and stop you from, uh, to stop this cancer you've got. Or, and, and so, in other words, prayer is robbed of even just the hope. And, and on occasions, in fact, I believe God does heal people. Not all the time, not often. Whenever people say, you know, God did this for me, I'm always suspicious. But, <laughs> but, so look, I'll leave it there. I've talked for long enough. And um, I'm sorry that was such a ramble. But um, I wanted to just open up that, that issue because it was playing heavily upon my mind. Thank you. I'll turn this off. David, lots of food for thought. <laughs> Brought me back to UTC days. <laughs> I'll tell you later whether that was a good memory or not. <laughs> We're up to our announcements, and I have a few, but there may be others that you want to draw our attention to as well. Um, sadly, a narrow faithful person has passed away, Shirley Arthur, and her funeral is on Wednesday. The information's in the mention, and it's an out of Warragi. You'd be most welcome. There's a congregational meeting after this service, and you've had weeks of um, information about that with the agenda and so on. But, um, I, that's after morning tea, I'm assuming. I don't have control yes. after this. Yes, thank yes, you. Yes. Wonderful, thank you, Jenna. Um, on the 8th of October, there's a fire safety training day at Dapto, and um, each worshipping community needs to have a couple of people who are trained in fire safety in case something happens, so you, you get to play with fire extinguishers. So it's a pretty exciting day. Okay. That's the best I can sell it, sorry. <laughs> I had training as an ambulance chapman, and I did have fun with a fire extinguisher, so I can say that truthfully. Um, the uh, food pantry out of Bain Basin, um, one of the local um, retirement villages, the staff there have wanted to help in some way, so they're organising a free lunch at the same time as the food pantry, so that when people come for their food, they can come and have a free lunch as well, and that's on the 27th of October. 
I share that because I think it's a, a lovely opportunity to mm. talk about how the community is getting involved, but also that you might pray for those who come and for those who serve. Are there other announcements that people want to make? The yeah, mentions got lots of lovely things in it. And uh, the other publication, check it out, is out today, so um, I'll draw your attention to those as well. Okay. Um, I'm not sure, you, you take up the collection here, don't you? Yeah. Someone? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Morris. That would be lovely if you could do that. Um, to take up our offering and then we will pray. Mm -hmm.
session today, we're going to uh, do, the, do our prayers the way Bomadari do them here, and they uh, open up for anyone who'd like to pray. Um, stay seated in your chair, and um, we'll, we've lined up three people, but there can be more, of course. So if you feel led to pray, then please join in, and uh, let us bring our concerns to God. Let us pray. Creator and Sustainer, we come now before you, gracious God, with the concerns on our hearts, the concerns for our world, our church, ourselves, our families. Lord, I pray for all the persecuted Christians all over the world, especially those in Pakistan. And I pray, Lord, that you will bring an end to this terrible persecution that is happening and bring peace into our world. In Jesus' name, I ask these things. Amen. Amen. Lord, in reflection of the song that we have just sung, let us pray in for those who are unfortunate by themselves, homeless, by themselves rejected by society. We think initially, as Jesus taught to his disciples to think of the local community and the extended community and then the world. So we think of our local communities of the three congregations seated here today. But you give us the knowledge and the capacity to lend a hand to those that we meet in the street that have no home. They may be sleeping in their car, they may be sleeping under a bridge. Those that society has forgotten. You think of the extended part of our country where homeless is raised. And then the world. Lord, draw your people near to you. Give them the courage and confidence to stand up and say, here is a helping hand. Lord, we remember the uh, terrible things that are happening in the Ukraine, Russia, the traders who are doing these things to the uh, to the ordinary people. Lord, our prayer is that you bring peace to that region and men uh, who are driving the uh, this, this thing, Lord, would uh, turn around and change their mind. Lord, and mm. stop the killing and stop the uh, overtaking of land and, and uh, areas, Lord, that they have no right to be in. We just commit to you today, Lord, because we look for peace. We've been through a period, Lord, where we've lost our uh, monarch. Lord, we, uh, we, we look as a, a nation to continue in peace in our own region and through our own commonwealth. But, Lord, we're reminded that in other places there are great difficulties where people are driven by greed and uh, their need to fulfil their own desires, Lord. We pray for peace, and uh, we declare peace in those places where it's needed today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we'd um, like to acknowledge our pioneers who came here 200 years ago and who built our churches and our schools and our hospitals. And I pray that in another hundred years' time, people will see that us as pioneers and judge that we looked after your creation in a just manner. Help 
them and say, try to rebuild lives that have been washed away, leave as those who make their life and living from the land and face ongoing challenges and difficulties as they look to how they're going to achieve income again this year. Be with all of those who live on major waterways with the news of a third summer of threats of significant rainfall and flooding. As those on those waterways know that dams are full, the land is sodden, and there is nowhere for the water to go but into those waterways. Help people to achieve the mental strength, the community and family support they need and give them a way of facing this threat and this challenge um, and continuing to thrive in your life. Heavenly Father, we've lost a dear friend in Shirley Arthur. Mm -hmm. Thank you for her life joy that she brought to so many of us. So we pray today for her boys <coughs> and their families as they mourn her loss of mother, grandmother and great grandmother. Mm -hmm. And we pray for Janice as she conducts the service mm -hmm. on Wednesday. Gracious God, we pray for those who are spiritually hungry, empty, troubled, people who don't know where to turn, who long for purpose and meaning, but don't know where to look. Pour out your spirit upon them that they may be filled. We pray for those who are physically hungry, their stomachs are empty. People around the world have been displaced, facing critical food shortages, suffering the effects of malnutrition and starvation, and watching helplessly as loved ones die. Pour out your spirit that they may be filled. And we pray for those who are emotionally empty, who are lonely and long for companionship and love, <coughs> who are caught in the grip of depression or overwhelmed with grief. Pour out your spirit that they may be filled. We thank you, gracious God, for your abundant gifts in our lives. And we ask that you would pour out your spirit upon us again. Fill us anew with your compassion and love that we might willingly share some of our abundance with those who are in need. We pray these prayers and those of our hearts in the name of Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We close with a few verses from the summons. Will you come and follow me? If I might call your name.
from this place enriched by the abundant love of God, nourished by the selfless care of Jesus Christ, and strengthened by the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion be with us all always. Amen. Amen. Amen.